So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, National Blood Clot Alliance pep talk. Our topic this evening is exercise, anticoagulation, and weight loss after blood clots. Uh, tonight's clinical guest is Dr. Jean Connors. Uh, Dr. Connors is a hematologist who received her medical degree from John Hopkins School of Medicine. She did her residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and her fellowships at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where she current, you currently practice at. Um, she has been awarded top doctor by both Boston Magazine and Castle Conley. I know you're a favorite amongst the clinical community and patient community. And her specialty is hematology, but her clinical interests are wide and varied, but include coagulation, coagulation disorders, pregnancy, thrombophilia, cancer-associated thrombosis. Um, she is and has been involved in several thrombosis trials, one of which she may discuss with us tonight. Uh, and with that, we would love to welcome you uh, to tonight's pep talk, Dr. Connors. Well, thank you, Leslie and, and uh, Todd. Thank you for having me on I, on this important uh, webinar. Uh, I think there's a lot to discuss, uh, and, and I know we might not get to everything in an hour, but but thank you uh, for having me. Super. Thanks. thanks. Okay. Thanks for coming. So um, as a reminder, tonight's event is for educational informational purposes only. Uh, we are not here to give you medical advice. We ask that you speak directly to your doctor for medical advice as it pertains to you in this issue, but we're hoping that we give you tools that will make you more educated about having that conversation with your personal clinician. Okay, so before we start, we do have some poll questions. I'm going to turn it over to Todd. So Todd, if you could kick off the poll questions for everybody. Yeah, when these questions pop up, folks, it's really important that you uh, answer these because this, this helps us with our outreach and our education's effort and, and all of that stuff. So just take a few minutes and I'm gonna read them to you. Question number one, did a healthcare provider speak to you about how to exercise uh, post blood clot? Yes, no, or not available. Our second question, did a healthcare provider speak to you about the possible risks related to anticoagulation and exercise? Yes, no, or not available. And our final question, if a patient advocate has been provided to you to answer your questions about exercise, anticoagulation, and weight loss, would you have used that service? Yes, no, not available. So if you guys could answer that real quick and then we'll uh, go through the results. And then we will have a, a closeout poll too at the very end. But if you guys can just answer these for right now, as soon as these uh, pop up our results, I'll give those to you. Thanks everybody for being here. This is a very important topic tonight. I'm really excited. Can't wait for you to share your story. Okay, here's the results. Did a healthcare provider speak to you about how to exercise post blood clot? 14% said yes, 83% said no, 3% not available. Did a healthcare provider uh, speak to you about the possible risks related to anticoagulation and exercise? 13% says yes, 82% no, 5% not available. And if a patient advocate had been provided to you, to answer your questions about exercise, anticoagulation, and weight loss, would you have used that service? Overwhelmingly, 87% yes, 2% no, 11% not available. So thanks folks for answering those questions. Wow, 87%, that's wow. amazing. Yep. Okay, so um, we're gonna kick it off. Uh, if you have questions, um, please put them um, on the side. There is a chat function, but we may not be able to get to all the chat function questions uh, tonight because as um, Dr. Connor said, who we're now going to change to Jean, uh, said uh, we have a lot to cover in an hour. So with that, okay, so Jean, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna break tonight's discussion into three parts, hence the name, weight loss, exercise, and anticoagulation. And the first piece is gonna be on weight loss itself. So, you know, weight loss after experiencing a blood clot. Talk to us about why um, carrying extra weight is a risk factor for blood clots. Um, for those that are looking to lose weight post their blood clot, you know, what is being recommended? How do you talk to your patients about this? Um, and then we want to talk about the GLP ones. Can you explain to the audience what they are um, and if they're currently being recommended to patients? So we have a bunch of questions in here. We'll keep going on this one for a little bit, but we'll start with that. Yeah, no, well, thanks, Leslie. And and I did forget to mention, please call me Jean. Um, and I am more than happy to make this a very fluid discussion because there's there's just so much information and it is kind of sad to see how many people don't get the kind of information that can help them live their everyday lives uh, once they've had a blood clot. So um, 
so we'll start with you well know, so first of all a lot of people in the united states are overweight right i mean over 40 percent of us um adults and in some would even say 70 percent have a body mass index over 30 uh uh which is what we usually uh call but um, as overweight and then over 35 is even more um concerning um you know, and, and it's a difficult topic because a lot of different things move together, but but obesity, um, as it's defined by the BMI, uh, affects your risk for clots in a couple different ways. And, and one of them may just be that you move less frequently. Another is when you're sitting, you know, it may be harder for the blood to return to your body, say your legs are cramped. But but we also know, and, and this is where the GPL, the uh, glucagon-like peptide one uh, GLP receptor agonists, long name there, um, actually were started when were developed for people with diabetes who had problems with low blood, sh- blood sugars and regulating their blood sugars, but they also had inflammation. And that's one of the ways that blood clots can form is inflammation. Inflammation. So like, just like having an infection, like really severe COVID can give you a blood clot, or even like if you're in the hospital with pneumonia or have other similar strong infections, that can trigger a blood clot just due to the inflammation. And so what happens when people are obese, they tend to do become insulin resistant. They develop um, increased uh, inflammatory markers. And we can see this in people when we measure things like erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. So, you know, getting a little in the weeds here, but, but the, the net effect, and and then you increase the blood pressure um, where usually when people are overweight, that contributes because you have more wear and tear on your vessels. They have higher pressure. There's more shearing force. There's more activation of things um, of cells and the blood vessels themselves. And that makes them sticky and diabetes makes them fragile. So you put that all together and you have like the perfect storm of combination of things to cause a blood clot. And and so um, obesity is one factor in many for some people, but in and of itself is a risk factor. And so one of the things I do in my day job is talk about inherited blood clotting disorders, right? And everybody's looking at people who've had a blood clot, looking for, you know, why, um, and looking for inherited blood clotting disorders. And, and I will say that less than 10% of the people in the United States have an inherited blood clotting disorder um, compared to at least 40% of the population um, being overweight. But when you look at one type of um, blood clotting disorder, the prothrombin gene mutation, PTG, or prothrombin gene G2021A, um, if you are heterozygous, you have one normal prothrombin gene and one mutated or abnormal one, your risk for getting a blood clot is the same as if you're obese. Right. And so obesity has the same weight as these inherited blood clotting disorders. Uh, and when and the risk for recurrent blood clots is high if you don't change your body mass index. So um, that's sort of the sort of the milieu of the, the first part of the question. The second part is that these um, GLP-1 drugs um, were developed uh, in patients who had diabetes and obesity and cardiovascular disease. And we've known for a long time now, 15 more years, that inflammation plays a role in cardiovascular disease. And we know that from some of the statin trials. I happen to work with a colleague uh, who, who really showed that uh, statins not only lower your cholesterol, but they also lower your inflammation. And so that can help prevent coronary artery disease, stroke, uh, and even deep vein thrombosis. So statins have become one of my new best friends, depending on on, um, what type of clot people have had and what their ongoing risks are. But those cardiovascular risks were still an issue uh, and primarily in diabetics. And so the GLP-1 drugs were developed for diabetics. It's kind of interesting because glucagon-like peptide is like glucagon and glucagon is a hormone like insulin, 
but it does the opposite of insulin. So when your pancreas secretes insulin, it drives down your blood sugar by driving the blood into your cells. But if your blood sugar gets too low, glucagon is released and that causes release of sugar from your liver and other stores. So they're kind of like a balance. And so it was thought that if you made something that bound to the glucagon receptor, um, you could get better blood sugar control. What was found though, is that not only did people have better blood sugar control, and if you're familiar with diabetes, there's something called hemoglobin A1C, um, which is hemoglobin, which lives in your red cells that ha- basically has sugar attached to it. It's glycosylated mm-hmm. hemoglobin. And so when you drive down your hemoglobin A1C, that means your blood glucose levels are lower and there's not a lot of extra sugar sticking to your hemoglobin. So they found that not only did they drive down the A1C and patients did better and they had better, what we call cardiovascular outcomes, the people treated with these G, um, glucagon-like peptide one, GLP-1 receptor antagonists, um, had less heart attacks, less stroke, less death when they had diabetes, but they also lost weight and they also had a decreased appetite. Um, And I've had patients on them. So I have never prescribed these drugs, but I've had patients for whom they've been prescribed um, and they've lost weight when other things didn't work for them. Although they did not try bariatric surgery or gastric bypass. But what they tell me is that you know, it's like you know, late at night and you're like rummaging through the cabinets trying to find that snack or you're working on a project and you're mindlessly eating the bag of chips next to you. That type of um, food uh, thoughts go away. And so who knows? There's a lot to learn about those. But but that's sort of how obesity is a factor in risk for blood clots and not only risk for first blood clot, but risk for recurrent clots. Um, in, in part of that is inflammation and part of that is hypertension. Um, but also those new drugs are something that we have been very dramatic in causing weight loss. So we have had um, a lot of questions lately coming in from patients asking about, we refer to them as the, as the GLP ones, the GLP ones, um, also known as things like we Gavi and, you know, kind of their stage yeah. names. Um, Mozambic, Wagovi, Montjuro, exactly. semaglutide. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. But do they also cause muscle loss? Because, um, and, you know, losing weight is great, but are you losing weight at the expense of, expense of losing muscle? So that is great. And there, there's, so these drugs have a lot of side effects before you even get to that point, you know, they can cause a lot of GI type distress in patients, you know, and they seemingly disparate diarrhea, constipation, nausea, vomiting. Um, But they can cause such rapid weight gain by limiting your blood sugar for when your body needs it, that your body, body starts catabolizing muscle. That's mm-hmm. it's a fancy way of saying it needs to get the energy from somewhere. So it's going to start getting the glucagon, the, you know, the glycogen stored in muscles out of the muscle. And then the muscles tend to waste because they don't have the energy they need to to keep themselves healthy and fit. And that's um why there's a big concern about you'll see if you go on the web and look for one of these drugs that you may be able to sort of finagle uh, getting a drug directly from, say, a compounding pharmacy without the oversight of a physician and a nutritionist or a, a, a program to manage your weight loss uh, and manage your diet. I think people, um, you know, from from what I understand, people don't recognize that they need to eat more protein and they still need to keep their blood sugars, you know, um, reasonably uh, good. You need to have a very balanced uh, and strong diet uh, on these medications. Okay, that's great. Um, the other question is people wanted to know, um, how do they interact with a DOAC or Warfarin if they're taking an anticoagulant? Yeah. So, so that's a great question. Um, there's really no uh, interactions whatsoever um with with um the doacs 
And there's really no interaction uh, with warfarin. Remember that there can sometimes be, you know, depending on what you read, you, you may have subtle interactions with warfarin, but um, because people are adjusting the dose, it may not be recognized and it may not be critical. So mm -hmm. if you are on one of these medications or contemplating the glip ones or the semaglutides, the Wagobis, the Ozempic, which by the way, are the same thing, but they are approved for different indications um, or uh, Monjaro, um, the, you should continue to you know, take your, your anticoagulant. Of course, you should be getting a prescription, uh, at least in the United States, from a physician who should be aware of all your other medications uh, that you are on. Okay, super. Um, you know, as we talk about weight loss, so uh, you know, Todd and I certainly together, I think, lost enough weight to create a person. Um, you've been great about keeping yours off. I have not been so great about keeping mine off. Is there, when you talk about, in, you know, inflammation, somebody like me, as an example, I lose, I regain part of it, I lose. Do I increase my risk of getting a blood clot um, after my initial blood clotting because of inflammation? Am I reintroducing anything that could cause a negative surprise? Yeah, no, you know, that that's a great question because before I even get to that specific question, one, when I give lectures to like medical people, you know, I, I about particularly uh, what we call inherited or acquired risks for for clots and, 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 you know, being overweight, significantly overweight is an acquired risk. I always say there's one risk that we cannot escape and we don't want to escape and that's age. So I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, there are some great curves that the risk of clots are about the same and they're about the same and they're going along and then you hit 60 and it goes like that. Okay. <laughs> so um, as you get over 50 and you get up to that area, it's kind of hard to sort out the, the differences there. But I do think that, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, the, I think you probably not had the ginormous extreme weight gain and weight loss and regain that, that might put you at risk, but in the heavier you are, we know the more that um, your inflammatory status is affected. And, and, and it's not the same in everyone either. So, so, you know, we see people, um, you know, and they have an elevated, like a mildly elevated white blood cell count and, and their BMI is 40. And, you know, we look for occult infections. They have those inflammatory markers, the SED rate, the ESR and the CRP are high. And we can't find, you know, some people, we find chronic sinus infections. We find teeth infections. We can't find chronic urinary tract infections and we treat those. And some of the inflammation goes away, but there's that innate um, just the stiffer blood vessel problem um, that, that uh, you know, I, I think is in the hypertension and the, the wear and tear um, is increased. Really interesting. And the role of inflammation. Are there any trials or research projects that are going on now with regard to inflammation and blood clots that, that we should all know about? Um, so that's a great question because uh, there's some not, so they're not directly at, um, aimed at um, blood clots alone. There have been trials of anti-inflammatory drugs like um to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And they've been um, somewhat successful um, in combination with, with other medications. But there's there's we there's talk about using statins to try to prevent uh, the Canadian. My Canadian friends are doing a, a trial looking at preventing post thrombotic syndrome uh, with statins, uh, and we're going to be looking into uh, something along those lines if we get funding from NIH. Um, but there's no um, say post first blood clot looking at, at any anti-inflammatory medications. And certainly um, it's hard to capture people at risk, right? So yeah. it, it, it's hard to, you know, get everybody on board with looking out for the blood clot. And I do know, and I'm sure you've all heard stories of people who didn't even know what a blood clot was till they had one, right? Right, right. So. Yeah, that was me. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> and and that's why I think it's great that the the work you're doing now is is so important because I have seen patients who whose family members have said, "Hey, you might have a blood clot. You better go get that checked out." Uh, and and that's so important. Okay, so just in terms of weight loss itself, so we do know that extra weight, higher BMI, um, is a risk factor, and inflammation plays a strong role there. We're still trying to figure all of that out. Um, in terms of the GLP ones that we just talked about, um, people are asking about this. They should speak to their doctor about it, but they should understand that there is a component of them losing muscle uh, and not just fat, which is kind of where we all want to go with with losing fat. Um, but it doesn't appear that they actually negatively interact with a DOAC or warfarin. But again, right. they should discuss that with their with their their doctor directly. Yes. Okay. And then what do you recommend to people just in terms of somebody says, hey, Dr. Connors, I want to lose weight. What should I do? How do you respond to that? Yeah, no, that's, I say, great idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and no, and it's serious because I do have these conversations with patients and maybe not the very first time I see them. You know, and I think when someone's first diagnosed, it is you Todd and, and Leslie, you both know it's kind of like, a, whoa, you know, where'd this come from? Oh my God, it knocks you out. It lays you flat. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so when I see people in the first month or two of having had a blood clot, because usually I can't see them on the first day, but um, it's just like what it is, what you need to do all about your anticoagulant. And then at subsequent visits where it's, or depending on their weight though, at the first one, maybe, but then subsequent visits, it's like, okay, let's start addressing your lifestyle issues. Let's start addressing, you know, your weight is a risk factor. And I will tell you that I have had patients, particularly before the DOACs, which tells you how long I've been doing this, um, that, <laughs> that, um, I, you know, didn't like warfarin. They, you know, I thought they had what we called an unprovoked pulmonary embolus. They tell me they were sitting there writing their book for like six hours and that was the cause. And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think that's enough. Um, and and um, their body mass index was, I remember this one guy in particular was over 40 and he did not want to be on warfarin and he lost weight and he's got his BMI down to 27. And I said, okay. It's been, but it's been three years, right? You know, because if someone has an unprovoked pulmonary embolus, we get very worried that they have a high risk of current, recurrent clots, particularly in those first two years. And so, but at three years, he was kind of like, you know, I know the risks, my my body mass index is down. I'm like, that's amazing, right? And so we took him off anticoagulation. So sometimes that's an incentive, but, but getting back to what I do, I actually have no problems referring people to weight loss um, uh, clinics. We have a weight loss clinic associated with our um, our hospital and it, it's comprised, they, they start with a nutritionist. Uh, you know, I, I have to say that I was actually fortunate. I grew up, my mother was what they used to call a dietitian, and now they call them nutritionists. And so I never realized, right, you know, the plain chicken and the no butter on the broccoli and no cheese on the broccoli and, you know, ginger snaps instead of hostess Twinkies and potato chips um, really, <laughs> really made a difference, right? And mm -hmm. And so I forget that not, you know, not everybody is aware of, healthy eating and substitutes, right? It, you know, there was a great study maybe 12 years ago. Um, you know, eating fish is good for you, right? All those omega-3s are great. They help with your, your again, it's sort of anti-inflammatory stuff. They help with your lipid profile. Um, and people couldn't understand why people in the South and what was called the stroke belt were still having more strokes despite the fact that they said they were eating a lot of fish, but they were eating fried fish, which mm. took away the whole healthy, right. whole, you know, the healthy aspects of fish, right? So the first start is a nutritionist, okay? And looking at your diet and looking at making simple changes to your diet and your routine. It does take some thought. It does take some effort um, to focus on your diet instead of having it be the last thing on your list and, you know, grab whatever, whatever is in your, like in my case, the hospital cafeteria um, or, you know, stopping by, you know, Dunkin' Donuts here in New England, right? Uh, if you watch the Super Bowl, you know how That's we feel about like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but um, 
uh, you know, so, so that's the start. And then, and then there's a lot of different alternatives to just taking, you know, Wagovi, Ozempic and, and Manjuro, right? Um, I have a close friend who, who joined Weight Watchers, but it really didn't kick in until she retired at recently. Um, you know, she again, overweight, borderline hypertension, borderline diabetes. She needed to lose weight for a lot of health reasons besides blood clots. But when she retired, she had the time to go to, you know, Whole Foods and to chop all those vegetables and to think about the healthy components. So there are ways to do that without it consuming your whole life. Uh, and that's why I would say start with a nutritionist. I know, Todd, you have experience and Leslie, you also have experience losing weight. Maybe you can sort of share how you did that. And then I can come back to medical um, approaches. Yeah, well, Todd, why don't you jump in here? And yeah, then we're going to move to exercise afterward. Yeah. Um, and that's why this topic is so important to me. I uh, so, so my mom died of a massive uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. It was sudden death in front of me. She was obese, extremely obese. That was just one of the factors, right? She she sat all day. She smoked. I mean, it was a perfect storm. And back in 1984, when you're a kid, you don't have a lot of people telling you about blood clots and, and why this happened to her. And I only found this out later on after my third blood clot and found out, oh, I've got an inherited blood clotting disorder. I'm factor five Leiden. My mom was uh, factor five Leiden, and so was my dad. So I'm I'm homozygous. So it, that that learning process came to me late, but I'm I'm sure glad it did. But as far as weight loss. I got to tell you, and I tell people this in the support group, the best decision I made, there were two things. I saw a nutritionist and I bought a digital food scale and I started tracking the grams of everything I ate. Now that sounds really intense and it sounds really time consuming and it may be for a couple of weeks, but then it starts getting easier. You start getting more used to it, but I knew exactly what I was putting into my body. And I got, you know, I have to admit, I was a Dr. Pepper freak. And, and if you look at pop or soda, depending on where you live, yes. you know, the term, um, how much sugar is in that is just yeah. unbelievable. And it's just insane. And when I stopped drinking pop, that right there, I started seeing the pounds melt off a little bit. But if it wasn't for me tracking the calories, and, you know, it, I'm a very active person. I love exercise. We're definitely going to get into that. Um, I mountain bike, I bike, I swim, I do. I love being active, but that wasn't the, you know, that wasn't the main reason why I was losing weight. I was watching what I was putting into my body and it took me uh, almost 15 months, but I lost almost 80 pounds and, and it changed everything for me. Yes, it, I'm on a DOAC. I've been on Zeralto for 13 years, but it made me feel better. It made me feel more confident. I uh, had to go out and buy all new clothes, but that is not a bad problem when, when when you're trying to lose weight. So I I totally back up what you said. I think seeing a nutritionist, that is the first thing I tell people in the support group when they ask about, well, I don't understand what to eat. Go yeah. see a nutritionist because they're going to help you. They're going to understand your situation. And and that's where I got a lot of my education. Um, but going back to exercise, um, like I said, it is so important to me. Introducing exercise after a blood clot you know, this may be one of the most inquired topics we receive at the National Blood Club. Okay, support group emails, phone calls. I've heard it now for the past couple of years. It happens all the time. What is the best way to reintroduce exercise? Is there any medical guidance or even guidelines which regard to exercise post blood clot uh, that, you know, is there a way there is, I mean, how can we prevent heart attacks and strokes? And we have all these things happen but we want to exercise. Why is it that we see some people getting right back into exercise, yet some people may take years to get back into exercise, if ever? What happens to one's lungs or legs or arms that often makes the comeback so hard? Yeah, no. So, so these are these are great questions, Todd. And again, I think your experience with the pop is huge, right? Um, because um, simple substitutions like that, um, you know, water, sparkling water. I'm a big fan of diet sodas, even they're bad, though they're bad for you know your bone density, right? But, but um, so so I think that that's important. I think you know let's let's move on to to exercise. Um, I used to be. I think I, you know, I um, exercised quite a bit. I grew up exercising. I ran competitively. I did triathlons competitively. I swam competitively. Then I've had a bunch of significant injuries that have slowed me down. 
Um, and I used to think, though, even, you know, with medical training and stuff, I used to think, well, if I can't go out and run five miles, I'm, it's not worth going out. Then it was like, well, if I can't go out and run two miles, it's not worth going out. And then you realize that every little bit counts, right, mm -hmm. um, with regard to exercise. So so I, I stress, you know, you may think that when you first diagnosed with a blood clot, walking out to the mailbox or walking around the grocery store is not something, but it is mm -hmm. right. And, and so I think, so, so, you know, every little bit counts now, though, we have to talk about differences in degrees of blood clots, right? So some people get what we call a calf vein blood clot. They get a blood clot below their knee. It hurts. Their leg can be swollen, but they're not terribly compromised if they catch it early. And, you know, within like a week, they feel completely fine of, after starting anticoagulation um, or maybe 10 days. And they are not as slowed down by their blood clot. Mm -hmm. um, then you get people who have significant pulmonary embolus, right? They all of a sudden, they're short of breath. They can't breathe. They're dizzy. They're lightheaded. They end up in the emergency room. They end up in the hospital and they might get thrombolysis. They might just be on IV heparin for a couple of days. And then the next thing you know, they've been in the hospital for five days or so and they get home. And every time they try to go up the stairs, they're short of breath from the pulmonary embolus. And so that um, leads to less exercise and they get a little debilitated, right? They, they get like astronauts, right? Astronauts up there have no gravity. It's like sitting in bed for, for however long they're up there. And when they come back here, they've got to regain the strength and the endurance that they had previously. And, and so I think that that's one thing you, you can work with your physician. You can work with a physical therapist we have cardiac rehab programs, and I have sometimes sent people with strong pulmonary embolus symptoms to a cardiac rehab program. So, so what I do tell people, and, and I think this is important to the exercise thing, is when you get a blood clot, one of three things happens, okay? Um, you know, after you start anticoagulation um, and after you've gone past a certain amount of time, which we can discuss, um, but it either goes away completely, it goes away partially, or it doesn't go away at all. And so if it goes away completely, um, then you really have less significant residual uh, uh, bad effects, for lack of a better word, right? Um, sometimes your valves and your, like the valves in your veins can be compromised and you might have a little swelling or a little post-thrombotic syndrome. But if you don't have residual clots in your legs, you're doing pretty well and it's easier for you to get back on your feet without noticing symptoms. If you've had pulmonary embolus and you have a lot of residual clot in your lungs that doesn't go away, that does limit your pulmonary reserve and your cardiac reserve. And so, so I think I can't sit here and give a recipe for everyone. What I can say is that um, you know how you feel and Todd, you, you know, as a, as a, a, a consummate athlete right now, I think you're on your bike every day um, mm -hmm. is that, you know, when you can push it and you know, when you can't. And mm -hmm. so when people are starting back again, Every little step, every step counts uh, and you need to build up gradually if you've been uh, out of commission for a long time. We used to say when I used to run competitively for every week you take off, it takes two weeks to get back to the same um, mm -hmm. fitness level, mm -hmm. right? So, so you know, and, and people can be, you know, I've seen some people have, you know, what I thought were big pulmonary embolus. They've got chest pain. They got a little, you know, dizziness, tachycardia. Um, and two weeks later, they're great. And then we have other people, it's six weeks and they're still not quite feeling right. They feel better, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're still kind of slowed down. So, for so, those, so go, go ahead, Jean. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I could keep talking forever. So. No, please do. <laughs> I, I was just going to say when, so, so after my pulmonary embolism, I asked my pulmonologist about uh, getting back on the bike and he thought that it was a great idea because it would help strengthen my lungs. But he said, be prepared to feel some discomfort from your scarring from, yes. from the damage that's taken place. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. He said, you'll just, you'll know it back off and yes. then repeat. 
And I really believe I concur with him that that actually helped me strengthen my lungs, was getting back into my activity, but being very careful, pacing myself. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you real quick while you were on this topic was, if somebody's had a, a, a DVT and the blood clot is absorbed, but they still may have a little PTS or they may, they may have a little bit of vein damage, is it still safe for them to do some leg exercises? Not just cycling, but I'm talking about weight training, leg presses, yes. calf raises, things like that. Can they do that? Yeah, no, and this is a great point because um, while you, I, I realize that I made exercise sound eh. Exercise is so important, okay? Um, because for a lot of reasons, um, um, the taller you are, the harder it is for your leg veins to fight gravity, okay? But even short people should exercise. And what happens is the calf muscles and the leg muscles with walking um, and the muscles contracting help push the blood back up to your heart. OK, so like, I mean, I, I I will be very, you know, the blood's in your heart and it pumps and it pushes it through your arteries and it pushes it through your veins. But after it beats, it stops. And if you're standing up, you've got these valves in your veins that that do this to prevent the blood flow from sloshing back down to your ankles. But if you've got scarring because of a clot and the valves stay open, then that's when even if the clot's gone, but maybe the vessel is the the valve is scarred, you end up with swelling. Now, if you increase the blood flow, like with running or cycling or standing even on your feet all day, say, I don't know, you're at some function where you're standing for three hours, you may see swelling in your leg. So what I do tell my patients with deep vein thrombosis is that compression socks are their friend. Okay. Um, and I know you had a pep talk on, on compression socks. My biggest bugaboo for people who have bad post-thrombotic syndrome is to put them on before the swelling happens because the compression socks put pressure against the blood vessel. That's, you know, like a, a, a drink, a paper drinking straw and it prevents the fluid from leaking out. But once the fluids leaked out and you put the sock on, it's not going to push it back into the blood vessels. But if you don't have a lot of post-thrombotic syndrome and you're going out for a walk, you're walking your dog, you're going out for a run, by putting on a compression stocking, you actually help prevent the swelling in your legs where you might have what we call venous reflux or vascular reflux. So so compression, you know, and let's face it, you see all those marathon runners out there wearing knee mm -hmm. highs. It's not a fashion mm -hmm. statement. It's a compression sock. You know, Michael Phelps used to sleep in a compression suit when he was uh, training for the Olympics. Right. Yeah. So I, I I think that that's big. But then but the, they, they need to be properly fitted, though, right? Don't people need to be really <laughs> exactly. careful well, on, on that? So, so that's interesting because we used to say, oh, my God, you would need 30 to 40 millimeter comp mercury compression for post thrombotic syndrome. And we're now re realizing just like exercise, something is better than nothing. And so what okay. I tell a lot of patients who have mild symptoms or notice swelling when they go out and they're on, or you know walking or running and they're on their legs for a long time, get those 15 to 20 millimeter ones off Amazon, you know, six for $20. Mm -hmm. Ask me how I know. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I look them up with my patients no. too. No, but but I, 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 I had a big leg injury and had a big surgery and it was really swollen for a long time. And I love those compression sockets. Okay. So, um, you know, try that because that may give you the support you need and then you can work your way up. Um, if you've right. had significant lymphedema, if you have very severe post-thrombotic syndrome, you may need to go to a medical supply company, get a prescription or even go to the supply company. They can be pricey depending on the brand. Um, most health insurance will pay for them if you have a doctor's um, prescription. So, so if it's minor, they don't need to go see a vascular specialist necessarily. No, okay. I, I and and you know, the, yeah, I mean, the the idea behind the compression stocks is to help when you are putting increased blood flow through your leg. And you might get swelling yeah. uh, and or, you know, people tell me after a long day at work, their leg just feels kind of draggy and heavy and it's a little tight, but it's not ginormous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the people that can go the Amazon route and see if it helps. And if it doesn't help enough, then talk to your doctor about uh, a prescription strength uh, compression. Thanks, Gene. That's great.
Okay, question for you with regard to the exercising. So, you know, using myself as the guinea pig again, I started out walking in my apartment. I graduated to walking down the hallway in my apartment building. I started to walk around the block in, in where I lived. And then I started to walk and walk and walk and I became incredibly obsessed with walking. I was also obsessed with my SPO2. And I want to talk about what that is, what that means for people, how they should think about it. I was, you know, when I first started to walk, I was in the low 90s. And then I would actually get to the number 100 as I was walking literally like miles every single day. What does that, what is that SPO2? What is the oxygenation in the blood? How does it help people? And should they be obsessed with it the way that I was? <laughs> we all got obsessed with it during COVID. Okay. Yes, that's true. Yeah. All right. During the first wave of COVID, I, I bought my father one of those little $25 O2 sat meters off Amazon. I bought one for myself. Um, yeah. So, so um, percent oxygen saturation of your blood is really what we're looking at. And your red cells carry oxygen. And um, no one is ever a hundred percent unless they're hyperventilating or exercising. But we all, when I was a med student, used to love to play with the O2 sat meters that beep in your room all the time and see if we could get up to a hundred. Okay. So, so anybody over, if you're over 92 or so, you're great. Um, it's when you go below 90 that um, we get a little concerned and, and that you can see that with, um, with, a new pulmonary embolus or residual, a lot of residual blood clot in the lungs. And so that's one of the things we evaluate when people come in to the emergency room or, or are seen somewhere for possible pulmonary embolus. You know, what's their heart rate? If it's high, if they're, you know, over a hundred and that's usually not their resting, we get worried. And I'll tell you why that fits into the oxygen saturation. If the oxygen saturation is low, below 90, we worry. And if the blood pressure is low as well, or if they're lightheaded and dizzy because they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. So what happens is your tissues need oxygen. And if your heart um, is pumping normally, and you have an oxygen saturation above say 92%, you deliver as much oxygen to your tissues as they need. But as the amount of oxygen gets smaller in each you know, unit of blood, your heart has to work harder to deliver the same amount of oxygen. And so that's when we get worried. That's why people get tachycardic. They're not getting as much blood to the heart or they're not getting as much oxygen in the blood. And then the heart has to work harder to get the same amount of oxygen out to the tissues. And that becomes a stress on your heart. And um, this is very sad. Actually, one of my husband's colleagues um, died of a heart attack with the last snowstorm we had here, totally mm -hmm. unsuspected. Um, so, so I say that because he was exercising um, and he had a different problem. He didn't have a blood clot, but again, that stress on the heart, you don't know, you know, we have a better idea of people's cardiovascular fitness and their coronary arteries, but it is, it's a long-term stress we don't want on the heart. We want to make sure that the brain gets enough oxygen, that the kidneys get enough oxygen. So, so that, um, it, you know, a, it, it, there's kind of a, a relationship be, between the oxygen saturation. And as it dips, you don't get enough in your brain. You don't get enough in your heart. Your heart has to work harder. Um, so it's it's a kind of, it becomes like a vicious cycle. And we like to break that cycle because as it gets lower, um, people also tend to work harder to breathe, right? So your breathing rate goes up and you can only sustain that for a certain amount of time until you get tired. Now, having said that, you, Leslie, when you first had your pulmonary embolus, if you were walking around the streets of New York and your oxygen saturation dipped to 85 for like 10 minutes, no no long-term damage, okay? <laughs> but but that's why we, we pay attention to it. Okay, good to know. Um, all right. I think um, in the interest of time, this is, I'm having a blast. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm having a blast here listening to you. And well, I said, a, I could talk all night because we could listen to you all night. I'd go all night. Let's do it. Totally. This is amazing. <laughs> okay. Let's move to anticoagulation because uh, this is one of the topics also. Um, and then we know that we have a lot of questions from people. We see you guys in the chat. 
we're going to try to get to everybody. If we don't, we'll try to follow up with, with folks as well and, and give you information, but we know you're out there. Okay, anticoagulation. So how should this impact one's decision with regard to which method of exercise they select? One of the reasons why I started walking wasn't because I was like, oh my God, I love to walk so much. It was because I was afraid to do anything else because I was on an anticoagulant. And so what? how should it influence people's decision about what type of exercise maybe they start with, but then eventually can move forward to? Um, and talk to us about what is the risk of being injured on an anticoagulant? You know, yeah. is there a difference if somebody falls down and hurts their ankle versus falls down and hurts, hits their head, um, yeah. as an example? And um, does it make a difference if you reference the two, you, you uh, to show that I was listening to you, you talked about a patient who had been obese, was on the anticoagulant for two years and came off of it because he dropped his BMI level. Does it make a difference if someone is on a full dose or a maintenance dose in terms of selecting what type of exercise they want to do? We have a lot yeah. more questions related to this, but let's start there. Yeah, no, these are, these are great questions. Um, and, and one of the reasons um, that I like doing coagulation as a work and, and dealing with patients as blood, with who've had blood clots um, is because it's fascinating biology, but also because every patient's an individual. Right. Um, and so, so um, exercise is great, as I said, and it does to Todd's point it, it, in, you know, keeping your lungs working, keeping your heart in shape, very important. Uh, even if you've had a pulmonary embolus, as you know, Leslie walking around, it can be anxiety provoking, right? Sure. Like, oh my God, I'm going to get another, oh my gosh, I have a little chest pain. Is it another clot? But let's talk about the risk when you're on full intensity anticoagulation. Um, I will say that the risk of bleeding with the direct oral anticoagulants for most people um, is a bit lower than warfarin. So, so we're already a bit ahead of the game if you're on one of those drugs. If you need to be on warfarin because you have severe antiphospholipid syndrome or mechanical heart valve, everything that I'm going to say applies to you as well. Um, so in... It's contact sports and it's injury, right? It's risk of injury. It's kind of like, like, let me tell you, I, I'm for real. I tell people to be careful with power tools, right? Like don't chop your finger off in the basement or cut off your hands because you're going to bleed longer. All right. So <laughs> and Todd's laughing, but you know, those people, right, Todd? That's right. I know a lot. I know a lot. <laughs> <in> the basement. <laughs> so, so, um, so it, what anticoagulation does is usually it does not initiate bleeding, okay? It doesn't just cause spontaneous bleeding in most people unless, you know, you, 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 know, you get very, very old and you have very fragile blood vessels in your brain. But other than that, what it does do is if you get a cut or if you get injured and you start bleeding or bruising, you're going to have a bigger bleed or a bigger bruise on anticoagulation than not. And so that's what impacts the risk of bleeding. So that it coupled with your experience level and your expertise with a sport makes a difference. Like I had somebody, again, this was in the day of warfarin, who was in her 20s. She was like 27 and she had had a big pulmonary embolus and she had inherited homozygous factor V Leiden. And um, she actually had a rare cystothionine beta synthetase deficiency. But anyway, it was like homozygous factor V Leiden. She was a rock climber. Mm -hmm. Now she said she would go to an indoor gym. She would wear a helmet. She'd wear the harness and she had a friend belaying her, right? Which means that she was roped in and she's like, really, I, I need to do this for my mental health. And I'm like, yeah, fine, right? Go rock climb. Make sure your friend is paying attention to belaying you and doesn't like, you know, let you slip. Um, if you land funny when you're coming down, if you twist your ankle, you may have a bigger bruise. But, you know, that's that's not going to kill you. Um, same is true for bicycling, bicycling, right? I mean, we want people to wear a helmet, right? Um, if you end up in a crash, you're going to have bigger bruises. So I think the harder part comes for um, high impact sports um, like uh, skiing, for example, um, where in there the frequency, it's, 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 uh, the frequency of the injuries is low, but the severity can be very, very high, right? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, for people on direct oral anticoagulants, I will actually have them skip a dose. I had a 
patient um just this win winter well it's not been a great winter here in new england for snow um who had a, a had cancer um and he finished his cancer treatments but he had had a blood clot and it wasn't time to stop anticoagulation it was time for him we could put him on the reduced dose like we do with amplify extension he was on a pixaban two and a half uh, milligrams twice a day or or the trade name is eloquist um but he he was um like a, a ski patrol assistant, a, a mountain greeter. And this was a big part of his life. And so he wanted to go out every Sunday and do this at his local mountain, which he's been doing because they make snow. Um, and, <laughs> and he, um, we have him skip the morning dose, right? We, and sometimes we have him skip the dose the night before. Now he can't do that. I have another patient who's, um, but how often does he do that? Right. So this is the next thing. So he does it every Sunday and that's okay. Right. Wow. Um, but because then he comes home and he takes it at night. I have a patient um, who likes to um, travel a long distance with her family to go skiing. Homozygous factor five Leiden, lots of clots. Right. Um, do, I tell her she can in, in some residual vein thrombosis, you know, take it while you're traveling the long distance. Right. Then when you get there, you can skip the dose. She was on the other ones, Zeralto, 10 milligrams that she used to take at night. I'm like, skip it the night before, go skiing. But then you have to take it that night because if you go skiing five days in a row and you miss five days, then I'm a little more concerned. So mm -hmm. when we look at the risk of recurrence, we're talking like if you have an unprovoked clot and it's, you know, we've stopped you, your risk of recurrence is about for everyone it's about 10 percent at a year if you stop anticoagulation but that 10 percent is spread out over the day so as long as you don't have other added provoking factors like driving long distance in your car or flying long distance in your plane you can skip a dose here and there and i will tell you there are some data and a colleague of mine named stefan mall has actually published a, a, a paper on this about professional sports players, right? NFL players, basketball players, who all of whom have had DVTs or PE. I've, I've seen some um, professional athletes. I've seen a lot of um, uh, Olympic athletes and national level uh, and international competitors in, in different sports. And we make the anticoagulation work for them. And we make it so that they can play their sport I uh, am um, effectively. So a lot of nuances in that question, Leslie. <laughs> uh, no, there, there certainly are. And it's definitely something to have a conversation with your, your doctor directly about, but we do get asked the question. And frankly, we do have professional athletes that we know are doing what's called intermittent dosing of their anticoagulant. Um, and so we want to address this with people that there is we just don't just don't people cannot just go out and do it on their own. Well, and don't right. stop, yeah, right. don't stop right. start. We, exactly. we see people that, talking about that, and it's like, no, don't do a, that. Don't do that. Yeah. No, that's and and the, the stop start thing gets gets to be concerning because I'll tell I'll tell you two stories. I mean, one, I had a a, a savvy person who worked for pharma before the DOACs were coming out. And she loved to water ski in the summer, right? And so she preferred to stay on anoxaparin, Lovenox during the summer so that she could skip the dose uh, Sunday morning and go water skiing every Sunday morning. So again, you know, that that's good. What I do find is that I have some people on travel prophylaxis and I see a question in the chat, which we'll get to, and they get a little complacent and they forget like, you know, I don't know why people from Boston fly to Aruba and I'm like, look, you've had a blood clot before. Your risk is really high of getting another one. Take this one you, before you get on the plane in both directions, right? Then they kind of slack off and they forget and they go to Aruba and they come back and they've had a blood clot. Now, Aruba's not that far, really. Like, I don't get it, but that's a Boston thing. So, um... The same is true if you start skipping doses on your own, you tend to like slack off, right? Mm -hmm. And then did I take it? Did I not? And that becomes an issue of, of you know, um, I, like we have um, Stefan published like a little calendar sheet for those, those pro athletes. I have patients make sure that, you know, they know when they're doing it. And 
most people are concerned and, and they actually talk to us about it before they might have a big trip or, or how to manage a trip or something like that. I think, okay. Leslie, to your point, you know, if your family's going away for a week skiing, it's a little harder, right, to, to skip the dose every single day or the doses. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's um, what we try to avoid. Okay, thank you. And we'll have to get a hold of uh, Dr. Mall's um, paper and share with everybody so that they can see it. Yeah. Um, two things, because we're hoping that in the not too distant future, all of our concerns about anticoagulation and bleeding will go away, possibly uh, with some things that are in trial. However, before we get to that next discussion about factor 11, specifically talk to women who are on an anticoagulant um, who are experiencing heavy menstrual bleeding, what can they do? They want to exercise. Um, you know, I went through this when I was first put on a DOAC. Um, you experience heavy menstrual bleeding. You want to be able to exercise, but it's kind of tough uh, yeah. to do that. So what do you do about that? What do you recommend to people? Well, this again, is it like, you know, I'm looking at the clock, right? And I could talk at least at least 15 minutes. So I'll try to be very concise. Not, not easy for me. Um in the first three months of having any uh, clot event, we don't like to interrupt anticoagulation, okay? Um, I will say that I do think that um, the way the doses between Rivaraxaban and Apixaban were designed so that once you get past the first three weeks of Rivaraxaban 15 twice a day or the first week of Apixaban um, 10 twice a day, the 20 milligrams once a day gives you a higher peak intensity anticoagulant effect with Rivaraxaban. And that does tend, I think, to lead, lead to more heavy menstrual bleeding than the Apixaban five twice a day. But we have had, once you get past that first three months or indefinitely first six months and you're on full dose, we have, um, and I talked to a colleague of mine and, and uh, dear friend Saskia Middeldorp over in the Netherlands, we tend to have the same approaches where we have women cut the dose in half for the first day of their period, or even the first and the second day, or skip it completely. Again, you know, being aware of the fact that they don't want to miss like a week in a row. Um, the exercise part though, because exercise does help. And just like it helps muscles and it helps blood flow, um, exercise can also help with um, dysmenorrhea and menstrual cramps over time. You can actually, you know, it can actually help in that um, area. So we advise women to talk to their um, care providers about heavy menstrual bleeding on anticoagulation and come up with strategies that work for them to, to decrease the bleeding overall. Again, maybe cutting down the dose, cutting it in half, stopping, you know, the first day. Um, and then we encourage people to, to exercise throughout. Again, there's a balance as Todd referred to between pushing yourself and, 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 you know, making yourself miserable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you want to, you do want to find that balance, but sometimes, you know, pushing yourself get out to get out the door and then you overcome that big hurdle and you're out there walking for longer than you thought. And it's a win-win. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about um, factor 11, what it is, what's out there in trial land. You're involved in this. So you've yes. got a front row seat to it and what this could possibly mean to those of us that are on an anticoagulant that do want to do hardcore sports at some point in time. Yeah, no, I, I think that this is the, the um, it's been a major progression in, in anticoagulant choices, right? So factor 11 is a blood clotting factor. Um, and interestingly, it's people who are deficient in this factor that sort of spurred people on to develop drugs to target factor 11, because there are some people walking around out there, you can't measure any factor 11 in them um, because they have um, homozygous factor 11 uh, mutations. And they do not have spontaneous bleeding. They walk around every day. They're doing just fine. If they go to surgery, they have some bleeding, or if they have major trauma, they have some bleeding, but otherwise they're doing well. And so the idea is that the coagulation system, if you've ever looked at a coagulation cascade, right, it has two different arms of how it gets activated. If you have trauma, you know, someone 
you go to surgery and you have a scalpel cut or you get a big cut, you know, from breaking glass in your kitchen, you release all this tissue factor and collagen and that drives coagulation and activates um, thrombin and you can clot your blood. And factor 11 really isn't um, it part of that. So, so we call that necessary hemostasis. You're clotting because you got a cut and you need to stop it. Factor 11 comes into play with all of those inflammatory things. You know, there are a lot of um, reactions that happen in the blood when people get infected. COVID was a uh, big one. Yeah. Yeah. COVID was a big one, right? I mean, uh, neutrophil extracellular traps and polyphosphates and histones and DNA and increased cytokines and increased upregulation of adhesion molecules. And factor 11 is a contact activator and that starts thrombosis in a different way. So the hope is that if we inhibit 11, we'll prevent all those nasty inflammatory related clots, but still allow you to clot when you need to um, because of the triggers through surgery or trauma and so that we can have less bleeding. So there was a trial, um, I, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm on the steering committee for a drug called abelasimab or abelasimab, um, which is a factor 11 inhibitor. And I'm on the steering committee for that drug for to treat cancer associated clots. But in the data safety monitoring board stopped this trial early in the fall of 2023. And it was, um, presented at the American Heart Association meeting um, in Philadelphia, where um, abelasimab in patients with atrial fibrillation at intermediate to high risk for strokes from atrial fibrillation had less bleeding on that drug than people on rivaroxaban. And that was huge news. That was very, very big because that's sort of, we hope, we haven't seen the final paper, but we hope that that really proves the concept that you can have less bleeding and still prevent strokes. And everyone's like, there's a little bit of secrecy around the results, although they were presented uh, at American Heart Association. It seems to be just as good at preventing strokes in atrial fibrillation um, as rivaroxaban, but with less bleeding. Mm -hmm. And so that's the hope that we'll have, you know, we'll allow people to go out there and ski and, and hit their head and, and still not bleed uh, or sprain their ankle. So to be followed, uh, to be continued, uh, you know. That's We're actually going to be doing a mini pep on this topic um, because more and more people are, you know, starting to yeah. catch on to factor 11. And, you know, hopefully as time goes on, we'll start to get better and safer drugs. Uh, yeah. The and there are a lot of trials open. I mean, yeah. um, the cancer VTE one is the only one for thrombosis right now, um, but they're soon to follow. The other ones are in atrial fibrillation and stroke. Yeah. And as we move forward, if there are other trials specifically that come up for VTE, obviously we want to be able to tell people if they want to participate in it. Okay. I know we are like, we have blown past the magic hour. Let's take some questions here. And we'll kind of like rapid fire with you. And then we are going to leave probably in the next 10 minutes or so. I apologize to everybody. We're going to get you to come back and continue with another PEP because this has been awesome. Okay, great question. Sometimes you get injured when exercising, muscle pulls and similar. Is there a way to take anti-inflammatory drugs with DOAX like Xeralto? Something like yes. Advil or similar, just to give you some relief. What do you recommend to your patients? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and so this is, again, one of those nuanced things where you're not going to find a lot of data about this, right? Um, and, you know, absolutely, naproxen sodium or Aleve, uh, ibuprofen or Motrin or Advil, um, all of those, the generic, the brand names, they're all good. Um, the issue is that um, anticoagulants affect your clotting factors. And aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Motrin, Aleve, Ibuprofen um, affect your platelets. Uh -huh. So when you inhibit both, you have a higher tendency to bleed. Now, just like skipping a dose here or there for skiing, taking a few doses of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug in most people do not cause major bleeding. 
If you take, say, the maximum strength ibuprofen, which the prescription strength is 800 milligrams every six hours, and you do that for two weeks straight, you are going to find that you bruise more when you bump into the coffee table or the, the door frame. And if you take it on an empty stomach, you may end up having, you know, some gastric bleeding. So judiciously, wisely, a few doses here and there are important. I see a lot of older patients who've had a blood clot and they have bad arthritis. And my advice is to take it when your arthritis bothers you the most, right? So mm -hmm. if it's when you're getting into bed and you can't sleep, take a dose, you know, not on an empty stomach. Um, or similarly, if you have to get up and walk around and you're going to, I don't know, your grandchild's wedding or something, take that dose so you can enjoy it. Okay, it's, like it's, 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 it's risk versus benefit, right? Because I have chronic pain, I have to have four injections, I can only have four um, a year into my yeah. groin because of the chronic pain. And so I talked to my orthopedic trauma surgeon and the hematologist, and they said it was versus benefit, there's no problem with you taking a leave if you want, but here's the protocol. It's, right. it's not like I can take it every day and every six right. hours or whatever. Right. It, you take it to get through to that next injection and it has worked. It has worked beautifully. Absolutely. But, um, let, let me just ask you a quick question because I, I really need to know this answer because my pulmonologist said this. I don't know how true it is. Is it possible for exercise to somewhat speed up the process of absorption? If you have a DVT and you're exercising, is yeah. there any chance that exercise may in, you know, give that chance of, of absorption a little, a little bump. That is an excellent question. And so just like I tell people that one of three things happen with you when you get a clot, right? It goes away completely. It goes away partially. It doesn't go away at all. Mm -hmm. The second part of that discussion is there is not much you can do to hasten the process that we call fibrinolysis, right? And, and so we haven't really found, I think, um, my experience is that the sooner you treat a clot, the more likely it is to, to um, get dissolved by your body's own dissolving stuff, which is called fibrinolysis. I, you know, sometimes you see people and you realize, you know, they could have had this clot for a couple months here, not even, even if, you know, not just weeks. And then those might take longer to go away. So, Todd, I don't really know if we have enough data to say whether that happens. But what we do know is but strengthening your heart, strengthening your pulmonary reserve, um, all of that definitely helps if you have any residual vein thrombosis, sort of getting around that that obstructive process. Yeah. It's a, it's a great question. I'm going to look for answers. If I find them, I'll send them to you. Okay. Great. great. Thank you, Jean. <laughs> okay. Uh, Julie K. Uh, I'm a competitive athlete senior. Doesn't matter, Julie, you're a competitive athlete. That's amazing. And part of my exercise and healthcare routine has always included sauna and cold water swimming. Thoughts yeah. on these contraindicated once clock cleared. Um, so that's a great question, right? Because, you know, you get into the hot tub at some resort and it says, you know, if you've had, if you're pregnant, or if you had too much alcohol, if you have medical conditions, don't, don't sit here. And you're like, huh? And that's because it vasodilates you. So um, sauna and, and, and cold, I think that was the, the combination uh, together um, is, is not a problem for clots. Okay. Unless you've got such bad, you know, brand new pulmonary embolus that you're short of breath walking somewhere. That's my gauge. If you can't walk up the stairs, then those extremes of temperatures may not be great for you. Um, again, today, patients are much healthier than they were 50 years ago, right? We don't smoke. We have cholesterol under control, blood pressure under control. It was the um, undiagnosed coronary artery disease that doesn't respond well to some of those abrupt changes. So keep mm -hmm. doing that. Um, <laughs> I won't say it's good for you because we don't know, but it certainly sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, just just real quick. So you see a lot of stories out there. Fitness watch saves somebody's life because <laughs> they're because they're getting some readings, right? And yeah. and I can see where that that, that could definitely be true. 
you, you were talking about, you know, we wear the thing on our finger, we're checking our oxygen. Should we rely more on that? Or can we also rely on a fitness watch like the new Apple watch claims to, to, to track all this stuff? Um, you know, how confident should we be in that fitness watch to give us that information that we need? Hey, well, I better go to the ER because my watch says this. So that's a really good question. And there's, um, there's degrees of accuracy. How's that? Um, I think step counters, I think, you know, calorie counters where, you know, they, you know, let's say they, they may not be accurate are, are one thing. I think the heart rate monitoring part is interesting because I will actually tell you that I have, you know, the hematologist here has seen patients and in, in, in other settings who've, who've had like, um, syncopal episodes, or they have, um, some of them have actually had strokes. And we've, I've said, show me your heart rate monitoring, you know, um, that because you can download it, right? Even the Fitbit, mm -hmm. which is very inexpensive compared to that Apple watch, you got an app on your phone and you can look at your heart rate. And, and, and I'm thinking of one patient in particular who was given the Fitbit as, as part of a, again, I work in the cancer world as sort of a um, you know, uh, uh, keep exercising, uh, approach, right. And, 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 and monitoring that. Um, and I'm looking at like his heart rate spiking at 140 at two in the morning when he's like asleep mm -hmm. and ended up, he had atrial fibrillation and, and wasn't really aware and had, had, you know, had, had crashed a couple of times and, or just didn't feel right. So sometimes people notice pounding and tachycardia. The one thing when the Apple Watch first came out was that it tended to overcall things, right? So, you know, if it's not quite reading right, it's sensing abilities, maybe overcalling something as a bad thing when it's more, you know, you're a little tachycardic from walking up the stairs, but the watch wasn't quite on tight enough and you didn't get an accurate reading and, you know, don't panic and go to the emergency room. So mm -hmm. a little hard to tell because I've not seen the new Apple watch, but I do think there is something to be said in general, if you're the type of person who likes monitoring things um, to, to wearing one of those um, even during exercise, for example, right? When, you know, you can kind of see where your heart rate is and are you in the right zone? Now, I know um, I have a friend who who admits that she's a little OCD um, about things and doesn't want to wear one of these watches because she feels she would be tied to it and yeah. always trying to get, you know, here we got the Garmin Forerunner here, okay? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> me too, me too. Um, uh, which I don't know how accurate the GPS is, but that's another story. But she said she would feel like, oh my God, I didn't complete my 10,000 steps today and I didn't get my heart rate in the target zone. And she said it would make her feel worse about her life. Um, right, right. right. The, right. the anxiety level goes up, you know, really yeah. high for a lot of people. They're me. checking it every five minutes. Even, yes. if, even with the thing on your finger, if you're checking it me. every five minutes, you're going to get yes. some different readings and you're going to freak out. Yes. So, so that's, so that's a great point that we're discussing right here, because I think if you're trying to figure out why you don't feel quite right, I think they can be helpful. Or yeah. if, you know, you're getting back into exercise and you have no idea what your target heart rate is and you're nervous about going above it, then monitoring your heart rate um, can, can be reassuring. But if you're relying on it for, you, you know, if you get too into it. We won't say obsessed about it. Um, it, you know, it can, you know, uh, we had like a Fitbit challenge a couple years ago for like team building in our hospital and we had like little teams and I was wearing mine and I believe me, I was getting my 15,000 steps and, you know, all of these things a day. And we still lost to the neurologists and well, the neurosurgeons who realized that if they put the little dongle thing, remember the little Fitbit, they yeah. put it on their shoe and they would sit there swinging their leg in the oh, meeting wow. and they, they were like <laughs> faking steps. Yeah. We're like, oh my God, right? So those are the type of people you don't want to be like, okay? <laughs> right, right. Good to know. Um, we're going to take two more questions and then we're actually going to, we have two more poll questions after this and then we'll let everybody go. This has just been amazing. I actually want to answer this question, but I'm not because I'm not a doctor. After three years on Eloquist with unprovoked DVTs and PEs, my hematologist has been wanting me to go off. I'm still 60 pounds overweight. 
slightly elevated factor eight. She is not concerned about either of those. Is it safe to go off? So that is a tough question. Um, and again, we're not giving direct medical advice, but the general approach is if they were unprovoked, the things that I assess are your age, your weight, um, whether or not you have residual vein thrombosis, because all of those things can contribute to a current clot, uh, and your personal preference and tolerance for risk, okay? Mm -hmm. Because we do know that, again, as I said um, half an hour ago or so, the risk for recurrence from unprovoked events is highest in the first two years, but it doesn't go away. So mm -hmm. for all comers, it's about 10% per year for year one and for year two. And then it's about, you know, five to 7% for years three, four, and five. So that when you get to five years, depending on which study you're looking at, you have a recurrence risk of 30 to 40% if you've had an unprovoked clot. Now, one other factor that people talk about is whether your deep vein thrombosis in the leg, and I see you also have PE, so that mixes it up, is in your calf or more proximal. I will say this, that the European Society of Cardiology in 2019 came out with a statement that said, anyone who's had a pulmonary embolus should remain on indefinite duration anticoagulation. So that's the European Society of Cardiology. Some people feel if you had a provoked post gallbladder removal PE, you could be safe to stop. But but I I personally would be a little uncomfortable with all the scenarios that you've given me about stopping at this time. I think that a reduced dose of uh, a Pixaban or a Rivaroxaban may be a good compromise. Um, I don't know if you've had any major bleeds. These are other things we look at. What's your kidney function? What's your other medications? But with unprovoked pulmonary embolus, we get a little more concerned. Mm -hmm. So as an unprovoked um, PE patient, I would encourage everybody to get a second opinion. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's our right as patients to get a second opinion. And I think they're very valuable. That's I did right. that. Um, you know, shortly after my diagnosis and, and it really helped me to have somebody else talk to me about what the protocol should be for me. And I was not thrilled at the thought of being on an anticoagulant forever, but um, I also wanted to stay alive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. that, that, that took priority. Um, okay. So I think we're actually going to stop tonight. I'm really sorry, everybody that we're just not gonna be able to get to all the questions. We're gonna to try to put something together. We have a NBCA launched a Sports and Wellness Institute um, a few years ago. And we're gonna to try to put a lot of this material out there for people, get answers to the, to all of your questions so that you have access someplace um, to go to get that information because uh, the poll question certainly demonstrated that people yeah. aren't getting the information that they, that they need. That's right. Okay. Jean, you have been unbelievably amazing um thank you so much we definitely want to have you come back this was just fantastic um todd we're going to punch it back to you for um for the poll questions we do want to in the chat i believe people have been uh, shown there's a link we want you to contact your congress people um yes. we're trying to to get funding out of congress for blood clot education awareness etc super important we need your help um, yeah. and then and we if, also, if, if they if they don't think that that voice their voice counts and that letter counts they're wrong because it does count and and it needs to be done and we've got a lot of people sending in letters and we want all the states represented so yes. that link is in the chat it's also in the support group I've been pushing it out there it's on our website it's on the stop the clock page uh, you can find that link please please act on that okay and then we also have bibs uh, for the five borough bike ride in May which Todd and I are both doing I'm scared yeah. because I'm not a bike rider. We're going to have so much fun. Wear your helmet. Where I want to wear my helmet. Um, so if you're interested in participating, we'd love to have people join us. And then, of course, we um, will be announcing we will have bibs for the New York City Marathon in November. That is like an NBCA party. So uh, if you're interested, by all means, 
um, you know, reach out to us about that one as well. And we're going to close this out with some poll questions. Yeah, I do want to tell you that back bike ride in New York is something else when they shut down the streets of cars and it's just us uh, cyclists out there. It's a great time. So I hope hopefully some of you guys can make it with us. Uh, let's do the poll questions real quick and then we're going to let you go. Did tonight's pep talk increase your knowledge about exercise, anticoagulation and weight loss post blood clot? <laughs> yes or no? Number two, after tonight's pep talk, would you feel more confident speaking to your healthcare provider about exercise, anticoagulation, and weight loss post blood clot? Yes, no. And would you be interested in participating in a National Blood Clot Alliance walking club if it became available? Yes or no? So we're going to get those results. I'm going to read those to you as soon as they get piped in here, and then we're going to cut you guys loose. Gene, I am so thrilled that you have been here. I love you so much. Your information is it's is amazing. just outstanding, yes. Uh, okay, here's the results. So did tonight's pep talk increase your knowledge about exercise, anticoagulation, and weight loss? 98% said yes. And after tonight's pep talk, would you feel more confident about speaking to your healthcare provider about this? 96% said yes. And the final question, would you be interested in participating in an NBCA walking club if available? 83% said yes. So we hope to see all of us walking together soon. That would be awesome. <laughs> Yay. I tried to vote yes for that last question and uh, was unable to. So. You. <laughs> well, you'll be walking. Thank you with again. This oh, thanks, fun. Todd. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I, I had a lot of fun with this. So I'm um, happy to we'll come back if, if you'll have me. Okay. Mm -hmm.